Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another day in the life working in IT. Today, I'm going to discuss all the tickets that I actually took yesterday and I actually touched yesterday. For those who don't know, my name is Jake. I am a system administrator at an MSP. An MSP is a managed service provider. So we provide IT services to other people. MSPs are notoriously known for being really high paced environments and kind of crazy environments. I will say I love my job. I love the high pace. I've been a sysadmin for almost a year now, so I get to help out a lot of other people, as you'll see, and I get to touch a lot of cool technologies, as you'll see. Let's get into it. So yesterday, I touched around 25, 30 tickets total, but some of them I'm going to be putting together because some of them were just the same nature of tickets, and I don't think they deserve to be talked about separately. So the first thing that I did, I usually start at about 5.45 in the morning, and I'm usually done by 2.45, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The first thing that I did was I had a ticket where I had to get this SD-WAN report for a company. SD-WAN is software-defined WAN. Basically, we have an edge device at the edge of every one of this company's branches, that gives us information on the quality of Ethernet. I can see like quality scores for the WAN links. Usually there's two ISPs and then the total quality score. So basically how good is things working? They want us to go through at some frequency. I think it's either every two weeks or every month and screenshot the last two weeks QoE scores for each branch. Now, I think this is super redundant. It's kind of like extra busy work, but I guess they don't have access to the portal that we have. So we got to manually build out these reports for them. This is about 15 minutes in the morning, took all of my screenshots. Then I went in and got uh, what we call the events for those branches as well, which is who accessed this VCE, this edge, who rebooted it, who did this certain thing, when did a link go down and all that stuff. Package this all into a nice email, send it off to the internal contract. After this, I had to look at four tickets that were kind of the same nature. They're called forwarding rules, and these are compliance alerts that pop in Microsoft. If somebody makes a forwarding rule on their mailbox, we have to check and make sure that it's forwarding internally, and if it's forwarding externally, that they actually made it. This is for data loss prevention. If you have a malicious actor, it's really common that someone will set up a rule to forward all of their emails to some other email or something of that sort. Again, so they can get their hands on some data, some info that they're not supposed to have their hands on. So I just went through, verified that all of these were good. You just go into Microsoft Purview, Compliance Alerts, Creation of a Forwarding Email Rule, click on it and look at the parameters. I could see everything was good. I dismissed them all. That was probably 20 more minutes. After this, I had a vulnerability remediation with an SFTP software that has been really pesky and uh, has some pretty high vulnerabilities for a bank. The thing is, SFTP is secure file transfer protocol, and it's kind of something that you really don't want to mess up for an org. This org has probably 80 to 100 tasks that are running every day, moving files, copying files, putting them all over the place. So I tried updating this. Uh, it went very poorly the night before, and I had to revert back to a snapshot, but I did keep some log files. So I grabbed those log files and actually just made a case with the vendor. I'm going to be discussing with that vendor. Hey, how can I get this upgraded, please? We have these vulnerabilities and I don't want to break stuff. After this, the fourth thing I did is I had three SSL cert tickets. SSL is secure socket layer. It's kind of what gives you that little lock at the top right of your browser screen. And basically SSL makes everything work. If you've taken your security plus, you've probably learned a little bit about PKI, public key infrastructure. SSL is based off of PKI and it literally is what makes the internet work. It's this network of trust that these devices use to confirm that what they're accessing is really what they think they're accessing. Very, very, very important. So for these tickets, I was basically just verifying who manages these SSL certs. They're auto-populated tickets in our system. SSL certs are usually managed in a DNS host. So something like GoDaddy, Network Solutions, uh, Cloudflare, DigiCert, things like that. So I'm verifying in these hosts to see, hey, do we really manage these certs? And I'm waiting on answers for all of those. Again, SSL is a very important concept for sys engineers, sys admins, cybersecurity professionals, network engineers. They also need to be renewed at a certain interval, and that interval is getting smaller and smaller. So I think they're going to drop it down to like 180 days in the next couple of years, maybe even shorter. Okay, after these certs, I had to discuss raising the domain functional level with a primary engineer for a company. I had to do this because I'm setting up laps using the new laps that's baked into the operating system of Windows. And in order to have those laps passwords, laps, if you don't know, is local administrator password solution. In order to have them encrypted, I need to have the domain functional level be at least 2016. Even if you have Windows Server 2019 or 2022, your domain functional level might still be way lower. In this case, it was 2012. I need to raise that, so I was discussing that with the primary, kind of getting ready to do that after hours. After this, I had a priority one ticket for a CEO who was blocked out of our systems and had his password reset. He was really worried that somebody was going around resetting passwords and stuff. I looked deeply into it, found that he was at a resort, logged into Microsoft from this resort, 
the IP showed from Nevada. It was unusual activity from our security tools perspective, and our security tool automatically locked him out of his account and reset his password. So it was a false positive for the security tool. I explained this to them, worked with the security engineer to get it rectified, and we were good to go. It's always better to be safe than sorry in situations like this, and I think that they were appreciative of that. Now, I made that sound kind of simple, but me doing that investigation probably took me like 45 minutes to an hour to actually figure out, hey, what's going on here? Like, who reset this password? Or rather, what reset this password? After this, I had an interesting printer ticket. I had a T1 reach out with a printer that wasn't working. Uh, he said that it was pinging sometimes and wasn't pinging other times. Hopped in, verified that I couldn't ping the printer from the domain controller. I also couldn't ping the printer from a device on that network. So from my perspective, either the printer got a new IP or some connectivity is just not there where the printer's plugged in. We checked and made sure that the printer itself had the proper IP on it. Still was not pingable. Subnet looked good. Default gateway looked good. DNS looked good. Everything looked like it should be pinging. So at this point, I'm thinking we've already restarted. We've already done all of our basic troubleshooting. There has to be something wrong between the printer to the wall, to the patch panel, to the switch. So we switched out the ethernet cable from the printer to the wall. It still didn't work. So I decided to have the T1 plug in a laptop to that ethernet port and it still didn't work. This confirmed with us that it was something in between the printer and that switch that wasn't working. Probably a bad drop, something bad on the patch panel. Now this could also be a bad switch port. So we're waiting to hop into the switch and verify that as well. That was kind of an interesting ticket. After this, I had a T1 reach out because somebody had gone to a website and it was making alerts like, you know, your credentials have been stolen or something like that. These are usually benign and it's usually trying to get you to click on something or call a number. They hadn't clicked anything or called anything, but I sent the tier one over to security services just to be safe. After this, I had another priority one for file access for a very high up new hire. And the way this company is set up, they're a hybrid company, but all of their files are in the cloud and all of their files are managed by security groups. I knew this just because I'm the system administrator over this company. So I helped someone through getting this person in the proper security groups. We confirmed that this person could see the files in SharePoint online, but it wasn't really syncing very well with their local device. We go to OneDrive, we click, you know, sync these files locally. And honestly, it's just being really slow. So we're just waiting on those to sync. We showed her how to access everything in the browser. So she's good to go. It was kind of an easy fix just because I knew what was going on, but the environment is super messy. So I don't blame whoever put the P1 in. If you notice the P1s that I get at my company aren't always complete dumpster fire tickets where everything's on fire. Sometimes it's easy stuff where they just need somebody who knows what they're doing to do it fast. After this, I had a cookie cutter ticket. That's something that we usually do where a drive space ticket was popped because this C drive on a server was over 90% full. You gotta understand, most things nowadays are virtualized. So most servers are gonna be virtual machines in our data center, or at least on something called an ESX host. So you've got this big hardware server that's an ESX host. It's running VMware or whatever else it's running. VMware has all these VMs. And as long as there's physical hardware, as long as there's more RAM or more SSD space, I can sp expand out the drives on these VMs. However, in this case, the server showed up as an R330. I know that Dell is a physical R330. That's a, that's a Dell R330. And the only way to actually add space to something physical is to plug in another hard drive or like literally add more space. This wasn't an virtualized environment. So I got with the primary and he basically said, yeah, we don't have credentials for that server. We don't even manage it. I don't know why it's reporting, you know, get this over to the right teams and get it out of reporting. So now I'm working on triaging with the correct teams and getting the server out of reporting. So even if it's over 90%, I guess we don't want it to make a ticket for us because we can't expand it anyway. After this, I had a T1 reaching out because he needed assistance grabbing a full software listing because we needed to see all of the PCs that have this certain software on it. It was like a dial pad software. We had to do some remediations and get rid of the software. Basically the internal contact had told him, hey, this should be like 20, 30 devices. We looked at it and from our reports that we can see, we only saw like four or five devices. So it just didn't make sense. This is one of those situations where we were just gathering data, but we were using all the tools at our disposal to gather data and then putting together a script to remove this software that won't absolutely break the entire computer. This was kind of a fun ticket, but it was also a situation where I wasn't able to verify any other computers that had that program on it. And the internal contact didn't give us any computer names. So I told the tier one, if he's purporting that 20 plus machines have this on it, then we, the burden of proof is on him to provide at least one machine that has this software that's not on our list. So the T1's reaching out to him, we're gonna get that and then we're gonna work on our script and kind of get this thing completely removed from these devices. After this, I had a fellow sysadmin reach out with a P1 of this person who was getting locked out every hour on the hour. Now, anytime I hear something like this, I'm thinking cached credentials, uh, some old non-interactive Microsoft credentials, 
um, something, you know, a device that's trying to log in with bad credentials, an iPad, a phone, something like that. We looked through so many logs and we couldn't find anything that was actually blocking this girl out every hour on the hour. I'm talking, we looked through intro logs, interactive, non-interactive sign-in logs, event viewer, things like this. It was all showing from her device. We checked credential manager. We cleared all the cash. We borked all of the Microsoft tokens and everything that we had to get rid of, we got rid of. It turned out after my fellow sysadmin reached out to the security team that it was one of our own security tools that was locking her out. Her account was added to a kind of a privileged account lapse type rotation solution that we have. And so it was rotating her password every hour on the hour, causing her to get locked out and have to re reset her password. This is one of those situations where I was completely perplexed. I didn't know where else to go, but it was just a lack of information. Like I didn't have the full context of the situation. It was a pretty fun ticket, honestly. After this, I had a couple of link down tickets, which as I was talking about those SD-WAN devices, they have two links, one for each ISP. An ISP is an internet service provider. When one of those links goes down, we get a notification and we get a ticket where we have to check, hey, why is this secondary link not working? Like now there's only one, they don't have a failover. They can't fail over to the other one. Why is it not working? In that situation, my go-to is reach out to the internal contact because I work remote. I'm not at these branches. Reach out to the internal contact and say, hey, reboot the modem, reseat all the cables. Let me check again and see if it's working. We had already done this. So I reached out to both of the ISPs. One of them said that it was a known outage. And so now it's kind of just wait and see, wait for them to fix things and check back in. I still have to check back in on that. And another one, uh, basically it was a radio and they have a POE injector. And he was like, yeah, you know, you might've rebooted some modem or something like that, but you didn't reboot that. So reboot that POE injector. So now I'm waiting on the internal to reboot that POE injector. And then we'll go from there. Usually they're tried and true. You reboot and things come back up. But these two were both pesky. After this, I had another SSL ticket. And this time it was an internal reaching out to us to create a new SSL cert. The process of doing something like this is to make a CSR, well, first to buy the cert, make a CSR. CSR is a certificate signing request. Put that into the DNS host. The DNS host will say, prove that you own it, and then they'll give you a cert, and you can do some key binding with that public key infrastructure I was saying. You can use something called open SSL and bind a private key to this cert. That way it actually works. Now, in this situation, I'm at the very beginning. I haven't even created the CSR yet. I had this guy reach out and say, hey, we want this, but I need to know, is it just for the root domain? Are we going to have subdomains? So like things before the main domain.com section, uh, that would be called a wildcard cert. We would use asterisk dot domain dot com. And of course, all of these have different terms and they cost different amounts of money. So I'm waiting on him to get back to me with which one he actually wants. After this, I had three more of those verifying SSL tickets. So I did them. I guess that puts me at like seven or eight SSL certs. I'm kind of just the SSL guy by now. After this, I had a tier one reach out because uh, they had eight people who needed access to our RMM tool. Basically, they need access to the portal to be able to see these remote devices that we can see. This is something that we do from time to time. I don't know exactly the ins and outs of the setup, but I just sent him to the account manager to get those ordered and get that sent up. Okay, I have two more tickets left. We're on number 19. I had a tier one reach out. They needed to share out some files of a terminated user. So I hopped into 365. I created a OneDrive link for this terminated user, and I used something called SPO in PowerShell. SPO can be used to, it's like SharePoint online to grant people permissions, admin permissions over other people's SharePoints once they are borked, or I guess even before they are borked. So I shared this out and confirmed with the internal people that they had access to those files. Good to go. Close the ticket. And then lastly, at the end of the day, I had a tier one reach out to me because they have an org who is currently using scan to email, but they're using a Google solution that they've kind of set up together. And it is completely non-standard. It's not anything we would ever recommend or that we would recommend setting up with our people, like using Google's SMTP service to send scan to emails. It's just not safe, again, from data loss protection point of view. So we want to set something up officially in Microsoft. I discussed with the T1 what would be necessary in order to set that up. We would use it something called direct send, which would mean we would need to add the public IP to their SPF record. If you don't know what SPF is, I highly recommend that you look it up if you ever want to be a sysadmin, security guy, anything like that. We have to add it to connectors in Microsoft Exchange Online, that public IP, in order for this to work. And then I explained to him what the host would look like, the SMTP host and things like that. There's a lot of nuance to it. If you want to send internally, direct send is the way to go. However, if you want to be able to send these emails externally, which again, we don't recommend and we don't usually set up for our people, you have to use something called SMTP auth. I don't think that that's something that we would ever set up, but I gave all of the information to the tier one, had a meeting with him, explained to him how everything worked. He's going to go back to the internal contact, ask him basically, hey, what are you looking for here? We, we're just sending internally, right? 
And once we get that information, we'll run it through the account team and we'll get it set up. So that was a day in my life. That was 20, it was probably 25 or 30 tickets if we include all of those SSL tickets and the email forwarding rules. As you can see, it's a busy life, but it's really cool because we get to touch a ton of different technologies and a lot of the times, the things that I'm doing, I'm just chilling out here on my computer, working away, discussing with ChatGPT, learning things, and then helping my colleagues, as opposed to having to answer the phones all the time and be that first line of support. That's my favorite part about being a sysadmin, as opposed to working in help desk. I hope that you guys found this useful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I respond to everyone. Appreciate you guys. Be safe, be smart, make some good decisions, and good luck on those tickets.